We're really excited to be here at Snapshot Wisconsin. Uh, this is a project that's been going on now for five years, even more than that in the planning phase. And it comes from a much bigger team. We are housed at Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources in Madison. And yeah, it's turned into a great big team. It started out with just two people and over the years it's just grown and grown. So a big shout out to all the people on the team for all the work that they do to collect the data, uh, get volunteers engaged and enrolled and uh, with all the troubleshooting and then turning the photos into science and decision-making products. And those are the things that I'll talk more about today. So what I'd like to go through today, and my colleague Allie is here too, which is really exciting, and she'll take over uh, closer to the end. So we're gonna tag team this. I'm just gonna talk about a background, current status of the project, how we use the data, and then some parts in the middle here are more geared towards if you're interested in putting up your own trail camera, some considerations. So deploying trail cameras and identifying wildlife, and then we'll end with a section on partnerships. So starting out here with background, uh, our tagline, let's discover our wildlife together. Uh, this project uh, is a partnership to monitor wildlife year round through a statewide network of trail cameras. And there's two main goals of the project. The first is to increase public engagement in natural resources through hands-on learning, so to become more engaged with citizens in Wisconsin, and then to provide data needed to make wildlife management decisions. And we're hoping to push the envelope there too on science and science products and what we can really do with the statewide network of trail cameras. This research is people-powered research. This is one of the coolest things about Snapshot Wisconsin is bringing together people from all over the state and really all over the world to help with this project. And one of the main ways that we do that is through asking people to host trail cameras. And the Urban Ecology Center hosts one trail camera currently and we'll uh, get another couple here uh, before too long. So that's really exciting that uh, we, we're now partnering with them in this project as well. Hosting a trail camera is laid out like this. We've divided the state into more than 6,000 survey blocks. So we took the township grid, which is kind of a, a very grid-like grid, <laughs> regular grid, and divided each township into four sections. So each block is a quarter township, about nine square miles, and we're looking for ideally one camera per survey block. And then what we're asking is for participants to sign up to host a trail camera in one of these blocks. So they sign up for a survey block, they get accepted into the program, they receive training and equipment, then they set up their trail camera and perform camera checks, and they screen photos, mostly to make sure they're marking and removing the pictures of humans, and then they can identify and count wildlife. And something to note in step two there, the equipment is provided by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources in full. So the, uh, there's no cost to the volunteer uh, for participating in this project. Uh, but, um, well, one of the requirements or one of the hopes that we have for uh, the properties that are enrolled is they're at least 10 acres in size. And this started out as a project mostly on private land and now we've extended it to public land to try to open up more opportunities to people who are interested in hosting one of these snapshot show cameras and may not have that 10 acres of land. That's our minimum that we prefer. So what are volunteers saying? Why do they want to participate in this project? And it's been really neat to have these citizen science and social science sides of the project uh, to try to understand this better and try to understand how we're connecting with the public. And so here's some quotes from volunteers. I want to know what's on my land. I've always wanted a trail camera. I wanted to volunteer helping our state's natural resources to highlight, highlight wildlife in our area. And then to contribute to a better understanding of wildlife in my county and ways to protect it. So people are interested in what's in their backyards and they're interested in trying to uh, trying to contribute to the, the bigger picture, the uh, bigger data set that we can use to understand wildlife statewide. 
we also have a lot of educators that are involved. And when an educator is involved, it just increases exponentially the number of people that are involved because of all the students then or the mentees that are under that educator. So about 15% of our volunteers identify as an educator. Here's a second grade classroom. And what they're doing is showing screens that have pictures of Zooniverse classification. They've made bar charts to show uh, the frequency of these different species. So these are things that are just so wonderful for us to be seen for our project. I think this is a kindergarten classroom here. I apologize for my uh, light situation with my camera. I have sun, which is wonderful coming in the window, but it's not favorable to my camera here. And just some more educator pictures here. It's just, it's been a really neat part of the project too. And having students involved, there's some, been some really neat discoveries. And so I'll read this one too. This is uh, from Marquette County, one of our educators that's been in the project for quite a long time now. It was really interesting. It was really amazing to see our photos of a fisher at the school forest contribute to the southward expansion of that species known range in our state. That was something that was really exciting to share with the students, especially because it showed them clearly why their work on this project matters and how they're contributing to science that has an impact. <clears throat> and this is the fisher they were catching on their camera in Marquette County. <clears throat> and like Skylar says there, that is uh, very much on the southern edge of what we think of as Fisher Range. And in our that was our first um, Marquette County Fisher detection from Snapshot. So that was a really neat thing that happened for that educator and his classroom. OK, I'm going to move on to the next section here about the status of the project. Uh, this is a map of Wisconsin, and those blocks that are orange are ones that have a trail camera. And then there's some blue areas, too, called elk areas, and those are areas where we have a lot of trail cameras. So we started out some of the snapshot monitoring in these elk areas, and we really increased the amount of cameras in there. Um, so there's just, you know, there's like 100 or more in each of those little blue areas. Uh, but this adds up now to over 1,900 cameras, close to 2,000 cameras in every single, and we have coverage in every single county of Wisconsin. We have more than 1,800 volunteers hosting these trail cameras, and the numbers are not exactly one-to-one -one because there are individuals who do host more than one trail camera. And we have a lot of photos, nearly 50 million photos. And that's the output of the project, getting these photos and trying to understand what they mean about the wildlife that they're taking pictures of. So in order to process those photos, we have to classify them. And there's two main ways we do that. The first is asking volunteers that are hosting the trail cameras as people we've been talking about so far to classify their own photos uh, that come from their own cameras, likely their own land uh, for the wildlife that they're seeing. So they can classify those as, you know, it can be as detailed as deer and then an adult antlerless deer and there's one of them. But another way we uh, are able to uh, expand this project even more, uh, even more people powered research uh, throughout the state of Wisconsin and globally is to put our photos on a crowdsourcing site. So we have a site, snapshotwisconsin.org, where people from around the world classify our photos. And in this case, they're seeing photos, not just from one site, but from all of, all of the sites or all of the sites that have been uploaded there. And many people look at the same photo and classify it. And that's the idea behind crowdsourcing is you get a consensus or if you don't get a consensus, you know that that is a tricky photo to classify and an expert may need to look at it or it may need to be considered unknown. So these red dots on this map are all the places, cities, I believe, that we have people uh, that have um, been classifying on Zooniverse on this crowdsourcing site. And then what's on the left is just the interface for what that site looks like. And this is just to show that Zooniverse really is a global effort. And so these red dots are, again, cities where people from around the world now have been 
classifying our snapshot Wisconsin photos. One interesting analysis we did, uh, and it shows up in one of our newsletters if you're interested in getting more detail, is we recognize there's a recent boost in Zooniverse classifications. I guess it's not so recent now, but right about when the Safer at Home order was happening in Wisconsin, we were seeing traffic on our crowdsourcing site change. And we looked at a period of time, an equal period of time before the Safer at Home versus after or, or during, I guess, the Safer at Home. And we just saw just huge bumps in the number of classifications and the number of users and in a given day, how many classifications were happening. Uh, and we're able to also see that prior to Safer at Home when uh, people, when we weren't, you know, under, these COVID restrictions, we're supposed to stay home and close to our houses. Uh, the, the week looked a lot different on Zooniverse. So you'd see a boost in classifications during the work week and a decrease on the weekend. And uh, during the Safer at Home, what we found was our Zooniverse classifications uh, stayed the same throughout the week. So I don't know about you, but I had been feeling, oh gosh, you can't tell one day to the next. Uh, they all kind of feel the same and they all kind of run together. It was very <clears throat> interesting to look at our data and kind of see, see that in our data as well. Also just talking more on this current status side of things about what's in our data set. So of all those 50 million photos we have, about 51% of them are blank photos. Nine, I'm just going to skip around here a little bit. 9% uh, of them are time lapse. So that is every camera takes one picture a day at the site around 11 a.m. And that's for us to just kind of get a record of what the habitat is looking like. And we have colleagues at UW Madison who are using those photos to better understand phenology measures uh, from these trail camera sites. Very small proportion of these photos are human, only 2%. 17% are yet to be classified into any of these other categories, so they're unmarked. And then 20% are the animal photos. And that's a one out of five is, a, is an animal photo, at least right now in our data set. And we have been, uh, because of our you know, bump, bump in Zooniverse classifications and things, we have been able to work through this unmarked bin a bit and um, really you know, able to classify those into these other categories, which has been pretty cool. So of those animal photos, this is how our photos break down in Snapshot. Two thirds of them are deer photos. And that's uh, really great for our project because of this project, the goals around the decision support were really initially around deer and predators of deer. And so for having so many deer photos, we are able to get at those metrics. And I'll show you some examples of those in a bit. 9% are squirrels, 7% raccoons, 4% turkeys, 3% cottontails, 2% coyotes, 1% elk, which is overrepresented because we have all those cameras stacked up where we know we have elk. Uh, and then everything else makes up about 8%. Of those deer photos, because there's so many, we can break them down more and almost two thirds of them are antlerless, 14% are antler, 8% are fawn, and 15% are unknown. So we call these adults whose heads are not visible. So you can't tell if they have antlers or if they don't. And here's a nice interlude for just looking at some photos that what we're seeing on the cameras. Hey, Jen. Yep. I have a question. Yeah. Um, how often do you get photos of mountain lions? Oh, not very often. That's a great question. Rare species detection is something that we do in Snapshot. I believe we've had three photos of mountain lions and they've all occurred in 2020. Allie, does that sound right to you? I'll just... Uh, Go through these photos, these first couple are elk. These photos where you have many different species together, so many turkeys, and are really fun for us. Here's some coyote squirrel, a couple of different species of birds, coyote and a skunk, a 
Jennifer knows these. Some bucks. So it looks like a little family group, uh, antlerless and antlered into fawn with spots. This may be our only picture with more than one badger. So there's two badgers in this photo. Sandhill cranes. Bobcat with kitten. Raccoons, silly. This is my all time favorite photo. It comes from Sawyer County. We call it the lots of otters photo. There's eight and it's a very high number of otters. Good coyote photo, porcupine, turkey. Here's a younger elk, bald eagle. Get some good selfies. Prairie chickens, these are kind of stick out as maybe being odd, but we do have a sub project where we have cameras specifically on prairie chicken leks. And it's worth noting always that a lot of our photos look more like this, where they're hard to identify and you don't really know what's going on. Okay, moving to our next section of using the data, do a quick time check here. The goal, uh, the second big project, or the second big goal of Snapshot is to pull together data for wildlife management decision support. So how to turn these photos into products that are useful to understand the population, especially by an agency like Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. So we have a lot of these ongoing efforts and some real successes here, and then a lot more things we're working on. So what we have so far are elk calf to cow ratios, population estimates and timing of rut from those elk grids. And we also provide wolf photo locations for annual wolf monitoring. And they use that information to try to direct tracking efforts to get better counts of wolves and packs, and then to ultimately get the minimum count of wolves in the state of Wisconsin. Turkey hunt to ratios, we have a variety of projects that are being worked on by graduate students, and this is one of them. Hannah at UW-Stevens Point is working on this project where she's looking at average brood size considering landscape type. So they're classifying lots and lots of photos, and what these pictures on the right are showing are, is some sub-project they're working on uh, around detection to see if our trail camera, our snapshot trail cameras, that would be this one in green, if uh, like what purport like what the detectability really is uh, for that snapshot trail camera, because there could be turkeys uh, around the back of the tree that aren't being detected. So she put these other cameras up to try to find those. And then also an audio recording unit uh, on the tree as well to try to catch these turkeys out here that are kind of within the range, but wouldn't be caught uh, within the field of view of the camera. And the rare species detection, we already had a question about that. So here's one of our mountain lion photos. We've had whooping crane. We, we're getting quite a few moose photos right now. And then here's a marten as well. And those have been the rare species we detected. And then I'll spend a couple slides talking more specifically about the deer stuff. Because I, as I mentioned before, deer are our main focus of the products that we're looking for out of Snapshot. And one of those is just in general, translating these trail camera images into deer population metrics. So one thing we're getting are fawn to doe ratios from Snapshot Wisconsin trail cameras. And what you see in this purple, shades of purple map are the actual fawn to doe ratios from Snapshot cameras, where the darker colors are showing higher fawn to doe ratios. And fawn productivity uh, is something that we need in our population models for deer. And we use it as an input to then estimate the deer population size at each of these counties. It's really cool to be getting these uh, data that the photos all have a location and they also have a date and timestamp. So because of those date and timestamps, we can look at activity patterns. 
And here's a plot that uh, the team made looking at deer activity patterns by age class. And this is, um, this is divided out into these different age classes. So antler lists are the adult does, antlered are the bucks, the males, and then the fawns are the young of the year. And this is just in the first few weeks after fawns are born. But it's interesting to see that the peaks in activity for um, antlered and antlerless deer are pretty similar. You know, they are crepuscular. They like the dawn and the dusk periods of time. But then the fawns actually use the day quite differently. And we always joke that they are going to bed early. Um, and that actually affects things like our fawn to doe ratios. And when we are collecting the information, uh, if we're only collecting that information when um, antlered and antlerless bucks or antlered and antlerless deer are most detectable, we might be actually getting a biased estimate of fawn to doe ratios. So Snapshot has helped bring some of those ideas to light. And this is looking at the activity pattern for deer in just a slightly different way. So before we were focusing on just a few weeks in the summer and looking at a difference in uh, those different sex and age classes. Here we're looking at like the entire or the summer and winter activity uh, and binning all of the deer together to show that when it's lined up against the winter, so the blue is winter and the orange is summer. So in the winter and in the summer, the peaks pretty much still align with the sunrise and sunset. Uh, but the behavior is a bit different. In the winter, it's, it's pretty clear that deer are very much hunkering down the midday and really uh, becoming quite active in that sunset period of time. And in the summer, it's a, it's a little bit different. And the, actually the biggest peak in activity is in the morning during sunrise and there's more kind of gradual activity throughout the day. So it's, we haven't had data like this before at the DNR to understand like at this scale, how deer are, are moving and, and using different periods of the day and how that might change based on who they are, if they're a male or a female or a young of the year. And you too could um, explore these data on our Snapshot Wisconsin data dashboards. This has been something that's launched just in the last few months. Here's a link here, data dashboard.snapshotwisconsin.org. And you can look at different species of interest to see, we call this a, a catch per unit effort to just a percentage of cameras which are detected for that certain species over a certain um, geographic extent. So you can kind of change the view if it's counties or ecological landscapes, and also over a period of time. There's three years of data now included, and that will be updated again as we have more data. And these are activity pattern graphs, which are showing how detection rates change by hour and then by month of the year for the different species. All right, so the next section we have is, if you want to do this, if well, if you would like, then um, certainly consider also just uh, you know getting in contact with us about volunteering for a snapshot Wisconsin trail camera. And there are some requirements, and you know not everyone can because we are just looking for one per camera per survey block that we have. Uh, but anyway, just check out our site to get in touch about that too. Uh, but there's also the option to put out your own trail camera that's not necessarily associated with Snapshot. You can discover and learn what's on your own property. So what I wanted to do next was just talk about what we recommend for deploying trail cameras in Snapshot and uh, so some best practices from our point of view. So first off is where to put a trail camera. So things to look for when you're scouting for a spot, it always pays to, to do your homework and spend some time in the area you think you'll, you'll put a trail camera to maximize what you might see on the photos. So you're looking for animal sign. Water, if you have water on your property or the property you're interested in, that can be good because there's some semi-aquatic species like otter and beaver that you could potentially get near the water that you wouldn't get if you were much more inland from water game trails, so just paths where animals are moving, and also a spot that's gonna be easy to clear the vegetation. 
because the, the growth in front of the trail camera can cause lots and lots of false triggers and it's no fun to have to um, weed through all those blank photos. Things to avoid when you're scouting, roadways, places where there's a lot of human traffic. That's for a couple reasons. I mean, most of our recommendations are around, we just really want to make sure there's natural animal movement. Uh, so a place that has these things, roadways, foot traffic or baiting, uh, obviously affects how animals will be using that area. And some people do bait in front of their trail cameras. That is definitely not something we do in Snapshot Wisconsin. And you'd have to look up the regulations for baiting in your county if you were interested in considering baiting in front of your trail camera. And then human structures. Uh, again, just the idea that it, for us on Snapshot, we want to best represent how animals are moving generally in Wisconsin. And so we want that to be natural movement. So staying away these, for these things is our best practices for us. Hey, Jen, we have a quick question. Yeah. Um, have you noticed any activity change of wildlife this year um, with quarantine compared to other years or other times of the year? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. That's kind of an ongoing analysis we have that we're working on. And it, it's complicated. It, that's kind of what it seems as we're working through the data. Uh, it doesn't seem like the quarantine affected each animal in the same way, and maybe some animals not at all. And it's hard to detect any changes unless you have a lot of photos of a given species. So we kind of narrow down the species we can look at anyway. But for something like deer, what we had been working on analysis and what we may be finding, although this is super preliminary, is that during quarantine, we're seeing equal number of photos of deer, but their activity seemed to be more concentrated in those dawn and dusk times compared to other, um, other years before during that same time window. And one hypothesis we have for that is these trail cameras, many of them are actually on people's own private land and many people are on their own private land much more during quarantine or at least during you know that first month after the safer at home in March, I think it was. Um, and so the thought is that uh, that the the quarantine, because of where our cameras are, because of what our uh, structure of our project looks like, it actually uh, could have led to some uh, behaviors of, of deer being maybe more disrupted uh, because normally they it might be quieter on those properties if if the people in the house were going to work in school, but instead they were there. So uh, super, super preliminary, but it is something that we are looking into and um, just really starting to wrap our heads around what it might all mean. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Yeah. So deploying the trail camera. So once you find a good spot uh, that has some of those things and doesn't have some of those other things, you wanna find a tree where to mount the trail camera. Uh, this is something that we've stuck pretty close to. We always put our trail cameras or ask volunteers to put them two and a half to three feet above the ground. And the only species that doesn't seem to catch too well with that are moose. <laughs> they have really long legs. Uh, we don't get many moose though, and they're still pretty easy to identify, even if you only have their legs. But this distance from the ground uh, seems really low, but it, it seems to work very well to catch a multitude of species. And then you mount and position the camera at that spot. And this is another thing um, that we ask uh, folks to do. Uh, and, and I guess another part I didn't really say is, is the part about having your camera two and a half to three feet above the ground is paired with this idea that there's a path of animal movement about 10 to 15 feet away. Um, so it's, it's really those two things that you think the animals will be moving at that distance away so then that height of the camera makes sense. You wouldn't want to put the camera at a place where you think the animals are gonna just be moving two or three feet in front of the camera because you're not gonna get good pictures of them. And in order to get good pictures of them and to maximize the number of pictures, 
kind of uh, angling the camera at the trail and the way you see in this figure is what we recommend. So it can, uh, the animal can trigger um, the camera and then there could be three clear shots. Our cameras are set up to take a series of three photos every time that there's a trigger. And then remove the vegetation in the site. That's always very important. Then set the date and time. Uh, this, it, it does happen where folks forget to set the date and time. I'm sure I've done it myself even. And then forget to activate the camera too. And especially if you're not gonna be able to check it very frequently, uh, you just wanna make very certain that you're doing those final two steps. And Jen, you, oh, Jen yeah. do you mind if I um, add something a little bit here? Um, I yeah. noticed in the chat that someone mentioned that um, the camera was taking really, really clear photos. Um, and something to keep in mind when deploying a camera is the angle that your camera is pointing. Um, so you want cameras to point north, and this seems to optimize the lighting um, in the trail camera shot. So that helps make the photos really, really clear. And it's something that our volunteers often have to play with, um, depending on the vegetation and the trees that are around. Um, but something that allows our, our cameras to take really clear photos is when volunteers really optimize the lighting in the camera site. So um, which um, cardinal direction the camera is facing really plays a large role in clear photos that have really easy to identify wildlife. Thanks, Allie, that's great. And then when you go to check the camera, uh, Often, if you have a camera on your own land and, and you're living there, you'll want to check it way more than this, but this is our minimum requirement that we look for in Snapshot that folks will check it every once every three months. And at that point, switching out the SD card and the batteries, we use rechargeable batteries. Uh, so each volunteer is given two sets of batteries and two SD cards, the camera can remain operational. This might be a setup that you want to think about for your own camera as well. And then you can record the date and time of the check and the number of photos and any damage. Again, this is a bit specific to Snapchat Wisconsin, but collecting data is fun and it could be a good way just to keep tabs on what you're doing with your camera. And also uh, if there were issues with setting the date and time, it might help uh, you backtrack to figure out when those photos may have actually come from. And then again, always, always, always removing the vegetation just so you don't get lots of blank photos. And that's, that's what I had there for, you know, recommendations. I, I kind of want to breeze through this next part to make sure we have enough time for partnership and uh, our closing thoughts and then any questions um, at the end too, although the questions throughout are great. Uh, so I'll probably move pretty quickly through this. This is just when you get to the point of having wildlife on your camera, how do you figure out what it is? And these tips could help you in classifying Snapshot Wisconsin photos on snapshotwisconsin.org or if you're a volunteer on your own camera, uh, your own Snapshot camera. So a big one that, you know, I know I still run into too is a wolf versus a coyote. So a wolf um, has a blockier snout compared to a coyote's thinner snout and rounder ears compared to coyotes tall and pointed ears. And obviously wolves are bigger compared to smaller coyotes and wolves have very large paws and very long legs, which is a way that I find often easiest to tell them apart. So this is a coyote, tall pointy ears. This is also a coyote. Coyotes can look pretty bushy, but still tall pointy ears and shorter legs. Whereas this is a wolf. Um, so it has that block ear snout, much smaller ears and definitely longer legs. Here's another coyote with its tall pointy ears, but here's a wolf. And so their summer versus winter coats can make this a little bit challenging, but this is a summer coat on a wolf, but again, really long legs, uh, bigger animal here. This is a wolf. And here's a very fluffy coyote um, that has that coyote face and taller pointier ears, shorter legs, and a wolf, taller legs. So this takes some practice and I know I still struggle with it too. Uh, and there are other places to get tips as well, but it sounds like this presentation might be recorded. So you could always go back and um, check out these slides again. 
Here's another set of animals, weasel versus mink versus fisher. So they are lined up with um, their names there, weasel on the left, mink in the middle, and fisher on the right. They go smallest, medium to largest. Uh, the tails are probably the, other than body size, uh, body size is probably the easiest way, but then the tails is, are the next thing to look at. That black tip on the weasel and it can turn white in the winter. And then on the mink, the bottom half of the tail is dark. And then on the fisher, the whole tail is dark. And then kind of their coloration, the fisher has this gradient of color uh, that becomes uh, pretty clear in some of these photos. And you can't really tell them apart um, by these white markings. They all can have those. Uh, but one thing that's really characteristic is that all white coat of the weasel in the winter. And then minks are closely associated with water. That's another good tip. So here is a weasel. That black tip tail is a giveaway. Here's another weasel. We circled it here. That's, that's a hard animal to find in this photo. Uh, and they're very small, so that black tip tail. So this is actually a mink. Uh, it's kind of uh, a me medium size between the weasel and the fisher, and it is uh, going into water there, it looks like. And then these last three photos are fishers. Um, so that's a bigger animal. You can see um, that gradient of color really well in this photo, light to dark. Oops, I, I don't know if you, I can't see that one as well. The fisher's on the very edge of the page there, but that's also a fisher. Cottontail versus snowshoe hare. Just a couple tricks here to tell these apart. Uh, they're, well, geography is a good one. So they do have different ranges where cottontails are mostly in the southern part of the state and snowshoes are mostly in the northern part of the state, but there's certainly some overlap of range. So cottontails have smaller ears and uh, snowshoe have these larger ears. Snowshoe also are very easy to tell apart in the winter because they can turn white or they do turn white. So that's a giveaway. And they have these big snowshoe feet. And a cottontail, that's a cottontail. Red fox versus gray fox. These are some of my favorites to see in our photos. Red fox on the left and a gray fox on the right here. And these are the nighttime photos of them. So the gray fox has this black mask and it always seems like its tail, um, let me see here, the tail of a gray fox always seems to be like outlined completely in black, including that tip. Whereas the, the, the red fox, what can be most characteristic is the black legs and that tip of the tail doesn't have that black outline. So these are always fun to tell apart. This is a gray fox, has that totally outlined black tail. We do see a lot of these at night. And this is a red fox. You can see the, the, black, the black legs there, the black markings on the legs. And this, is, this can get tricky because this is actually a red fox that has a, a black color phenotype. It's just a, a bit of a different coat color for a red fox, but it certainly does happen. Okay, well, that was the end of my section and I'll hand it off to Allie now. And Allie, just let me know when you want me to advance the slides here. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Jen. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about like the partnership that we would like to have um, with the Urban Ecology Center. Um, we, of course, Jen, if you wanna advance, really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the Urban Ecology Center's work in the Milwaukee area um, and we really love that our cameras can help um, provide access um, to natural areas for folks in this urban area. Um, and it's obviously an important subject to talk about in terms of um, getting folks access to nature and an opportunity to learn about wildlife. So we see that trail cameras and citizen science in general, it's a really powerful tool to engage people of all backgrounds um, in conservation work. Go ahead, Jen. So in addition to the trail cameras that um, the Urban Ecology Center has in natural areas, we would love for all of you to get involved and encourage your friends and family to do so as well. So as Jen mentioned, you can view photos of wildlife from across the state collected by our volunteers at snapshotwisconsin.org. Um, and this is Zooniverse, our um, crowdsourcing platform. Um, so that's a, a great way for you to see wildlife and work on your identification skills. 
Um, and then also, as Jen brought up and showed us a little bit of our data dashboard. So data dashboard or snapshotwisconsin.org is a great way for you to play around with um, really great visualization tools um, and engage with the data that our volunteers have collected and shared with us. Um, it's a great way to do this from the comfort of your own home right now, um, classifying photos on Zooniverse and then checking out our data dashboard. And if you have any questions on either of these things, um, classifying image, classifying wildlife images or um, questions about the data dashboard and how that works, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. We love getting questions from our volunteers and folks um, who are interested in our data. And we would love to hear from you. So we appreciate um, the opportunity to be a part of the Urban Ecology Center's work in the Milwaukee area. Um, and we wanna make sure our project and wildlife monitoring and conservation in general is um, more accessible to marginalized groups and folks that have limited access to nature and urban areas. So we really, really appreciate on being able to work with the Urban Ecology Center and look forward to where this partnership may go. Um, but we'd love to hear from you. How can we improve our project and our um, tools and resources to help folks learn more about wildlife and interact with the data that we've been collecting? So feel free to shoot us an email. Um, we always love hearing from you. Um, I did see a question come into the chat here. Do you know if other states have similar programs? Um, yes, there are other states that have similar programs. Um, Jen, do you wanna talk about Snapshot USA at all? Yeah, sure. Uh, Snapshot USA is a effort that's trying to bring together snapshot or um, trail camera projects from all across the United States and actually from North America, I believe. Uh, and Snapshot Wisconsin uh, is a participant in that project and they have many, many, many data points from across the state or across the USA in uh, different eco regions and things, which is pretty cool. Snapshot Wisconsin is a, is, is a bit unique at the scale um, it is for a state uh, agency. Uh, so there's a Snapshot Indiana and that's uh, just, you know, maybe a handful of cameras 20 to 50 cameras, that's uh, not quite the same way. And then there's all, all sorts of other um, projects that go on across the state. But I think what makes Snapshot Wisconsin a bit unique is its focus of being housed within an agency uh, and it's for decision-making, not for pure research. So that's all I had to um, share about this partnership. And I, um, we really appreciate the opportunity to be able to be involved with the Urban Ecology Center and look forward to hearing from you if you have any questions or thoughts about our project. Yeah, thanks a lot, Allie. That was a great last few slides to remind us about uh, yeah, how we can partner together in some of our larger goals for the project. And just want to give a shout out to all the folks and collaborators and other partners that are on this project too. Uh, thank you, especially to the Snapshot Wisconsin team at the DNR. And thank you, thank you to the thousands of volunteers that make this project possible. It's pretty cool to say thousands of volunteers. It's uh, quite, quite a great effort.